I would want to convince you that you can't buy DevOps. So I think probably most people realize that, but there's a lot of vendors, and I'm, I work for a vendor. So, hey, buy our DevOps tool. Yeah, no, sorry, doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so for today what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna define DevOps. I know that's pretty um, a big thing, especially at the end of the second day. Um, but I'm gonna tell you what, what I think it is, um, and we're gonna disagree, fair, fair warning, on some of these things. Um, go through some organizational concerns for actually adopting a DevOps culture. Um, some architectural concerns, and some continuous delivery stuff. Um, there's no test at the end, but there, there is some homework. So I'm gonna go to pretty high level, but I'm gonna show you some books that I've read, some people I've talked to, those kinds of things that, that really helped me. Uh, and I think they'll help you too. Okay, so who am I? I'm Ken McGrage. Um, I live in Seattle, Washington, which is 80 hours and five planes away from here, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah. I, should, I was in Edinburgh last week. I should have just come here directly, but yeah, anyway. Um, I'm a technology evangelist for ThoughtWorks, which is just a really weird way of saying, ThoughtWorks is this company, it's a software delivery company, and there's a lot of really smart people there, of which I'm not really one of them, but I watch what they do, and then I tell you about it. That's what an evangelist does. <laughs> um, I was trying to do the math the other day. This is, I think, around my 30th DevOps days. Um, started about five years ago. I'm one of the organizers core. That's relatively new, um, and I, blog event, sometimes, not very often, frankly. Before I can go into what is DevOps, I really feel like I need to say what it isn't, and this is where um, might cause some controversy. Here's the link for open spaces. Okay, so we can talk about this later. Uh, it's not a tool set. There's no such thing as a DevOps tool. Okay, I don't know why monitoring tools can't still be monitoring tools, and continuous delivery tools can't be continuous delivery tools, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a tool set. Okay. Sorry, if your title is DevOps engineer, it's also not a role. I know a lot. I, I talk to our recruiters and stuff, and they're like, hey, you know, it is, because it is. And things take on meanings. And, um, you know, Kleenex, the tissue, they can't, tra that trademark's not enforceable anymore because it became common use. So I'm not saying that you're a bad person, if you're, but I don't think it should be a role. And I'm going to go into why. It's also not a team. Sorry, previous speaker that said DevOps team. <laughs> <laughs> I cause problems, it's what I do. <laughs> anyway, so um, I watched Dan's talk from here last year. How many people were here last year? Okay, so um, Dan's one of the other global organizers. He opened up last year, and I, I watched some of his. And he went through CAMS, but for everybody else, I'm gonna go through it again. Um, one of the earliest attempts to define DevOps came from John Willis in 2010. For anyone that's not familiar with John Willis, he was one of the people that attended the first DevOps days in Ghent, Belgium in 2009. If you don't know this, the term DevOps came from DevOps days. So this, this, the term DevOps was created for this conference. Um, John took it to North America. And so he's probably one of a few people that have been to a lot more of them than me. He came up with this. Um, the C is for culture. If you don't have this, full stop, you're done. If you can't change the culture, it doesn't matter. Um, automation, so a lot of us, when we think about DevOps tools, we actually look at automation tools. Um, it, like I said, tools, to, I don't think we have to change their names just because we're gonna change another, another buzzword. Um, measurement, I'm a real big on this one. Things like um, value stream mapping, et cetera. There's lots of ways that you can measure process and see how long does it take me to do a thing today? Okay, I changed this. Am I doing the thing faster or am I doing the thing slower? If I'm doing it faster, woo. If I'm doing it slower, stop doing it. Okay, you can't tell if you don't measure it. Uh, and then sharing. Hello, DevOps days. Jez Humble, a man who I respect greatly, um, wants to add lean to this, make it comms. Um, yeah, okay. But I think you, you can, you can you know, have a DevOps culture without practicing lean. So take it or leave it, but it's there. Now this is gonna be really, um, I don't know what the right word is. Um, I made up my own. <laughs> Probably egotistical, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, I needed an elevator pitch. I needed a, a, a definition of DevOps that I could give somebody at a conference like this to say, from now on, for the rest of this talk, for the rest of today, if you see me in another conference, whatever, if I say DevOps, that's what I mean. It's a culture. Full stop. I don't care what your title is. Um, our product teams, our engineering people sit with our marketing people. The marketer for that product is on the team. Okay, so it's a team. They're thinking of what the product might do they're developing the product, they're deploying the product, they're operating the product or system. System is the word I'm most uncomfortable with here. 
Um, there's a blog there that goes into all the details of the phrase, but that's what I mean, culture. Okay, so traditional model, traditional IT model. You've got your development teams, everyone's seen this before. We do this in Agile training too. You've got your testing team, your operations team, and they have the walls. Um, I was supposed to do this talk yesterday morning at 9 a.m., and I was going to say I get to be the first person to mention Conway's Law. How many other people, have it, has other people mentioned Conway's Law that I didn't think? Awesome. <laughs> Yay. Um, Conway's Law is interesting because, um, I'm going to give something away here, the law is as old as I am. It was written in 1967. And it basically says when you have an organization, and an organization of a certain structure, that's the way your system's going to turn out. If you have a division that does billing, you're going to end up with a billing application. You just are. Um, they were talking about dams and all other kinds of things. But it really does apply. So if we go back to that traditional thing, it's going to end up looking like that. We're going to end up with a monolith that we can hand to the next people. Maybe that's QA. I use QA very loosely here. Maybe that's security or performance or compliance or the people. And then they're going to hand it over to somebody else. These people are all measured differently, et cetera. Oops, did I go ahead one time? Yep. Okay. Renaming operations team, DevOps team, does not solve the problem. And I don't know, I'm not sure how it is here, but in North America I see this all the time. The basic thing of what they're doing hasn't really changed that much, but now they're the DevOps team. Um, now, there's a different skill set. You know, I mean, we're hearing a lot about Kubernetes, and there's a different skill set for sure. There's more code being written, et cetera. But at the end of the day, they're still writing infrastructure, creating infrastructure for on somebody else's application. Creating a DevOps team to provide automation for everybody else also does not solve it. Because you still have, the walls are still there from a communications perspective. Okay, so your QA people don't know what's coming down the pike. They get a feature. They don't know how to test it. Is it performant, et cetera? By the way, they shouldn't come down the pike. They should be involved from the very beginning. That's also doesn't very often work. The one exception I have seen to this is when this DevOps team is a team of mentors. So if it's a team of people that are really excited about doing the DevOps and they know how to do things and what have you, and they go embed on product team. Okay. So what we really want to do is we want to have a team, a culture, where people, regardless of title, imagine, deploy, and operate a system. 80 hours. <laughs> so that we get to this. Anybody familiar with this quote from Werner Vogels from 2006? That's how old it is. Um, Amazon has a rule. You build it, you run it. If you build the service that sells the shoes, you run the service that sells the shoes. Um, and it's used all the time. But it's always taken out of context. <laughs> Don't bother reading it. Um, you can later if you, if you want to, or you can go ahead and read it. It's not taken out of context in a bad way. The reason they did this is they said, he said, how did he put it? He, um, brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software. Brings them into day-to-day contact with the customer. The customer feedback loop is essential. Okay, so if you write a new feature, you want to know now, is that going to make my sales go up or down? Okay, I know we're all measured on different things and so forth, but if our company's brought a business, we kind of, doesn't matter, right? Okay, so this is all really easy to talk about, but that won't work with my architecture because, da 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 da, -da. okay. Um, Jez Hummel does a talk that says why continuous delivery can't work here or something like that. And in it, he mentions it, one of my favorite examples is HP, Hewlett Packard, did continuous delivery on their printer firmware. <laughs> so, I mean, what? Uh, a guy by the name of Gary Groover wrote a book on it. Um, and they're like, oh, so how'd you do the framework? How'd you do the continuous delivery? How'd you do the whatever? It's re we architected the firmware. It's like, wait, what? It's like, yeah, th we needed this goal. And th in this case, it wasn't culture and automation we needed to change, it was our architecture. Sometimes that's how. There, I mean, there are applications that aren't going to play well with some automation. It's, it's just true. One of those examples, big monoliths, okay? And I know this is really probably very, very high level, but so you have this massive monolith and all the functionality were in process. So let's say, real world example, the project I worked on five, six years ago, um, this is a, a travel agent, online travel. 
And th the application's all basically one application. But travel agency change, you got Airbnb, you got ride sharing, you got all these kinds of things happen, and they needed to scale like things for their hotel service for certain countries. In order to scale hotel reservations, they had to scale car rentals in Singapore. Nobody rents a car in Singapore, they take taxis, okay? But they still had to pay money for capacity to increase for that, because it's a monolith and they had to, they had to scale it that way. And so that's the way it scales. They also couldn't release anything. So things are fast moving and like airlines are coming up with new specials all the time and you know, British Airways forgets to book your flight and it takes you 80 hours. I'm never gonna let them go, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's all kinds of things where they needed to be fast reacting and they couldn't. And this particular travel company was like the big one 15, 20 years ago and they were getting darn close to going out of business because everybody else had the specials and they didn't because they couldn't react fast enough. So what they needed to do is they needed to develop into smaller pieces. Bum, bum, bum. Buzzword number nine, microservice. Uh, I think we were part of creating this one. I'm sorry, I'm, apologies for that. <laughs> um, but it does mean something different. It's not just service by another name. Okay, if you're on, if you're on one of our projects, or, you know, then, and somebody uses the word microservice, then you know that it is an independently deployable thing with well-versioned APIs. So I can deploy this by itself, period. If it's sharing database with something else, not a microservice. If I have to deploy another service at the same time as this one, match versions, not a microservice. Okay, it needs to be independently deployable. In this way, you can distribute this across multiple systems, replicating as needed, da 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 So our magical travel company um, that did this, I think five or seven years ago, I can't remember exactly, now they can scale only the thing they need. Now they can do fast actions only the thing they need. They switched from doing um, interview-based requirements analysis, so they'd go out and talk to travelers, and what do you want, and what do you need. Um, I think it was Steve Jobs said, don't ask somebody that because they don't know. Um, they switched, they got rid of that completely. Now the teams are allowed to experiment, do whatever they want, try something. Deploy it, A-B test it, do sales go up, yep, keep it. They go down, turn it off. The, pre the, the, the VP of Worldwide Engineering, you can look it up now, I'll tell you, it was Expedia, it's Amand Bhutani, um, was named president of the brand last year. Because now they own all their competition. And it was because they can respond quickly, okay? They didn't do it by automating the monolith straight out. They did it by taking out pieces by piece. You know, they take out the service that was the, needed to scale first, right, change all the calls, turn it off. Now the second, you know, it took time, but it can be done. It's, it literally saved their business. Homework. Uh, full disclosure, these are all current or former co-workers, but they're also good books. I do not know. The qu he asked if they're part of the free giveaway that O'Reilly's doing. Building microservices has been out for a couple of years, unlikely. Um, building evolutionary architectures just came out. No, I don't know. Oops, sorry. Someone's still taking pictures. Bad again. Okay. We'll post slides, too. Okay, so if we go back to our product teams. Now what these product teams can do is they can own a part of the business. So we have a team that owns rental cars, we have a team that runs tax payments, hotels, some, they might have more than one, they're gonna have more than one. Okay, because it's, they own this thing. They have to run it, which means it's their phone that goes off at 3 a.m. when it goes down. One of the biggest problems we have in our industry is burnout. I do a whole talk on it. And one of the biggest causes of burnout is a thing called absence of fairness. It's when your phone goes off at 3 a.m. because I screwed up. That's gonna burn you out. <laughs> when teams own it, you, it's, it's surprising how fast the code gets better when the person that broke the code gets woken up at 3 a.m. <laughs> so it's a good summary. Our, our chief scientist wrote this as a foreword to that building of evolutionary architecture. The point of all of this is to get fast feedback, is to find out is the change we're making helping or hurting our business or um, security, whatever it is. It's to, to, it's to react quickly to something. I'm talking fast, so. <laughs> okay, but we still have to deploy somewhere, right? So, I mean, it's not magic. Um, I have a feeling, because I was looking at the program, um, DevOps days are interesting, because some DevOps days are 100% culture. 
Some are really technical. This one's on the more technical side. I mean, kernel debugging, woo. Um, by the way, I'd much rather, as an organizer, I'd much rather have people who don't talk for a living, who do, do debug kernels, do this, and have to switch screens a couple times, than pros. So submit next year. Anyway. So you have to deploy somewhere. Okay, again, this is going to be very, very high server, high level, but you know, we have all this um, you know, on-prem, in infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a real easy example. If anyone in here gets these confused, um, think of it like your car. You call it a car here or an auto? I don't know. Um, if you do infrastructure as a service, in the U.S. at least, when you lease a car, you don't own it. Basically, the bank buys the car from the dealer, and you're long-term hiring the car from them. So they own the car throughout. And at the end of the lease, you give them the car back. Um, you owe them nothing. They owe you nothing. You walk away. Um, the car still has a value, so the value to us is we pay a lower payment during that because we're not buying the car. But we still got to take care of a lot of stuff because when we turn it in, they're going to inspect it, and if it doesn't, you know, that's, that's where the thing comes in. If we look at platform as a service, that's more like a car hire. If I go down to Hertz or Budget or Avis or whoever, and, and that's your problem, I'm going to put fuel in it, I'm going to drive it, I'm going to turn it back in. If I wreck it, yeah, they're going to say something. But for the most part, they just wash it sometimes and give it to the next person. Yeah, <laughs> I rented a few of those. Uh, and then, of course, we're all familiar with software as a service. So I'm a really big fan, if you're trying to do DevOps transformation, of the idea of a platform as a service. Now, an example I, I like to use of why on this is cloud.gov. So cloud.gov is an official service of the U.S. government. Um, it's relatively new. But it, so if you're a U.S. government and you want to run an application on the Internet, there's tons of paperwork, tons of things you have to do. There are 325 required security protocols that you have to meet. Uh, Amazon does a special sectioned off section for them, but it's still, it's not easy for them to do these things. And so if they want to do something on, you know, quote unquote public cloud, they, it's 325 things. They have to prove that they checked. If they use cloud.gov, 269 of those are handled and signed off by cloud.gov. So now the development team has that much less they have to worry about. There's 42 that are shared. So there's some shared responsibility there. And there's 15 that are handled by the customer. So the development team, so I said, you know, products, not projects. You build it, you run it. Hey, but we still have security and compliance and denial of service attacks. And that stuff's still very, very real. And those skills are not going to probably be on your product team. But with, when you have a platform team, a lot of times they're taking care of these things in a, in a large way. Obviously, there's still a bunch of things at the application level. Okay, so... This is why I like platforms. Now, that said, okay, I can tell you because I've looked at a lot of airplane windows in the last couple days, there's no computers up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is really just somebody else's computer. So when I, when I talk about platform as a service and I talk about cloud, I talk about whatever, I don't necessarily mean Amazon or Google or what have you. It could be you. Okay, because not everybody, I, had, I did a thing a little while ago where all the ops people got shoved onto product teams. And there's people here are like, whoa, no, 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 no. I, I have no interest. That's not what I want to do. That's not what I studied for. That's not what I want my career to be. Okay, those people still have a spot. A lot of people are thinking, oh, DevOps means kill, you know, no ops. I hate that term. Uh, no, it's, it's not that at all. I like platforms, but it might be an internal team. So at ThoughtWorks, we have a team, we call it TechOps, that provides platforms that the rest of us can use. So we can deploy an application, much like cloud.gov does. And so you can use PaaS internally. There's open source, there's Cloud Foundry, there's commercial versions of that, there's lots of things to do this. Because by the way, there are other things involved here. And it, the truth is, not everyone is going to end up on the product team. Okay, we do need to make sure we're compliant, we don't want to go to jail. We do, don't want to end up on the news because we're, we're hacked, so the security team, et cetera. These people still exist. So how do we get them into the mix? How many topics can I cover in one talk? 
Okay, so this is where the automation comes in for me. Um, and I am highly biased, okay? I'm just going to be right out front. Um, I started at ThoughtWorks nine years ago. Um, I think most of us in our career have a thing where we can look back at something that happened, and at the time, yeah, okay, who cares? But later, it's like, oh, wow, that really mattered. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for me, one, first was the early 90s, yes, I'm old, when the senior system administrator at the ISP I was working at said, you learn this web thing, I'm not wasting my time. Um, the second was nine years ago when I started and I sat down next to Jez Humble at ThoughtWorks while he was writing the continuous delivery book and he was teaching me what continuous delivery is before the book came out. <laughs> and so I kind of got to really look at it. And so that's one reason why I'm like, no, DevOps is not the actual do. So this is Jez's definition of continuous delivery. Um, Jez and Dave did write the book, so I'm not going to try to um, redefine their stuff because I'm not quite that egotistical. Um, but there are a couple things here I like to focus on. Um, the first thing is get changes of all types. Okay, so you hear automate all the things. There's all kinds of terms for it. I don't think you really can automate all the things, by the way. Uh, I have another friend, Jason, who does security testing. He sits in a dark room wearing sunglasses. I, 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 seriously does pen testing, you're not going to replace Jason. You're not going to automate Jason out of a job. Um, but you automate the things that you can. But it's all the changes. I don't change a ver version of OpenSSL by logging into a machine and typing RPM, yes, UVH, OpenSSL. I change the version of OpenSSL by changing a chef recipe or a puppet manifest or a, a pick your tool. Okay? And that goes through my continuous delivery pipeline. The other thing I like down there is the, uh, on the last line there, safely. Okay, um, you hear a lot about, oh, I can get to production in 10 minutes. Yeah, bull. If you can get to production in 10 minutes with an application of any size, you're not doing all the testing. Now, there's times when you might need to, and there's times you can set up, and you can do that, and great, okay? But safely, let's be safe here. I don't know, what's that old American TV show, Chips? Be safe out there. Hey, 80 hours, I get a pass. More homework. So this is the book, came out in 2010. Um, again, both coworkers when they wrote it, now they're famous and they're off doing better things, but anyway. So I'm real big into this. Continuous delivery is what you do as part of a DevOps culture. And a lot of other things, monitoring and so forth. Um, but continuous delivery is the automation, it's the A in CAM. that there's a prerequisite. You can't do continuous delivery if you're not doing continuous integration. You, you can't. It just, it's just not safe. It doesn't work. Okay. So continuous integration, we did a study. It scared the heck out of a lot of us. Um, ThoughtWorks puts out this thing called the Tech Radar. Um, there's a new one coming out on the 30th, actually, if you want to subscribe to it. But it's just, we have 5,000 people globally. And it was a, it's a way to communicate. These are new technologies we're adopting. These are things that are on hold. We don't use them anymore. These are things we're assessing, et cetera. Um, and we came up with a thing called CI Theater and put it on hold. CI Theater is the illusion of practicing. So this is the one that scared me. Tools don't solve problems, folks. Sorry, I'm wearing a t-shirt for a tool. They do not solve problems. O only 10% said that having Go CD or Jenkins or Bamboo or Team City or whatever is different than actually doing CI. You have to do the practices. I'm not going to go real deep, but I am going to show you this quick test that was written um, by Jez Humble and Martin Fowler. Um, Jez wrote the continuous delivery book. Martin wrote the white paper that defined continuous integration 18 years ago. Um, every developer commits at, to the, at least daily to the shared mainline. Long live branches, feature branches, da 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 da. Open spaces to argue later. You might be doing really good automated build and test. You are not doing continuous integration, full stop. If you're not doing trunk based development, you're not doing continuous integration by the guys that defined it. Every commit triggers the automated build and test. And if build and test fails, it's fixed within 10 minutes. These are the first, the unit tests, the very first part of it, not the whole pipeline, et cetera. But, the, you know, build going red's not a problem. I, uh, I don't want to punish people for, for trying hard things. Um, our applications are so big now that you can't run all the tests locally usually. And so the build's going to break. 
Um, and that's okay, because it's okay. Actually, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to say why, because there's a slide coming up that's going to say why. Um, but it is important that you fix it. It's not okay to say, well, that's always red, because the network connection to that goes, is flaky. Well, then when something else actually is broken, you won't know it. We've all done that. We've all gone into a build that's been red forever, and we knew why, and ooh, there was another thing in there for the last week and a half. Oops. Okay, so you've got to fix it. And we're, not, we're like full team stop. That's CI. Okay. Again, I know this is 101. Continuous delivery pipeline, its job. Team commits code. Code fails, gets going back to the team, goes further and further each time. You get more and more confidence the further it goes left um, that it's good. There's two phrases that are often interchanged and should not be. Um, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. They are two different things. There's a massive difference between them. Not really. In continuous delivery, a human is making the decision to deploy or to release the software. Okay, so GoCD is on-premise open source software. It's released roughly once a month. Um, you know, somebody tell Apple and Google Play this, but we really don't want to update our things 10 times a day, a lot of times. Um, and so continuous deployment is just fully automated. If the, pest, if the tests all pass, it gets into production. That's perfectly fine for some things, not for other things. It's my personal belief that the amount of testing and the types of testing and everything else are exactly the same. I think you have to have a pretty good pipeline to, be, to feel safe with continuous deployment. Don't get me wrong. But end state, they're the same pipeline. It's just the difference of somebody deciding, yes, I want to release. Um, by the way, I, I covered this in a different talk, but um, don't confuse deploy with release like I did a second ago. There's lots of ways you can deploy software onto production environments with things like feature toggles and routing rules and whatever where it's not actually being used by anybody yet. Released is flip the switch and now it's on. So it's okay to deploy to production all the time. Test the deployment, right? Um, without tr actually turning features on. But outside the talk, but again, we can chat about it later. Okay, so let's go back to our teams. We have our, our product team, security team, compliance team there. Um, and again, there could be lots and lots of others. What's their role in the pipeline? So typically speaking, the development team is responsible for these things. I would say the vast majority of pipelines I see, and I see a lot of them, um, this is the entire pipeline. I mean, change some words. It might not be functional tests. You might call it something else. There might be another one in there. It might be three steps or eight steps. But you know, so it's a path to production, basically, um, that is completely owned by the development team. So the development team makes a change, and it gets to production. And we want that. We want to enable that. But there are some things that can go wrong. Deploying insecure software is bad. Deploying non-performance software is bad. Um, Amazon did a study, and this is, has to have gotten worse because it's been 10 or 12 years, that something like half a second of drop in response time, or increase in response time, I guess, was a 50% drop in sales. It was like, whoop, they can go somewhere else. So it has to be high performance these days. Um, I'm not sure, do you have, have Sarbanes-Oxley here and all those kinds of neat little rules where, so there's a rule in the United States where if you do not put the proper controls in place, basically, and you get hacked and a bunch of money gets stolen, your stock price goes down, CIO goes to jail. It's criminal. It's not a fine. They go to jail. Um, and so compliance is important <laughs> to a lot of people these days. Uh, we also don't want to deploy stuff that sucks. So we want to get it in front of people as often as possible. There's Sonotype did a study a couple of years ago. Um, Sonotype's a company that runs Maven Central for any Java developers out there. Um, what Maven does, for anyone that's not familiar, is a package management system. You type, you know, MVM build, it downloads the internet, creates your thing, and says, here you go. Yeah. Average Java project using open source Maven Central was 106 components. 23% of them had known critical or severe security vulnerabilities that had been fixed in later releases. Maven uses a thing called POM. .xml that you say what version you want of the thing. 
And you can say this version or better or what have you, but people had hard-coded specific versions in there. And so on the open internet, or like wherever they're running these Java programs, 23% um, of them got vulnerabilities. So hackers, go to it. <laughs> yeah. There are lots and lots of tools to check this. I mean, it's simple. I mean, obviously, Sonatype sells something. That's why they did it. So I add something else to um, when I talk about what a CD pipeline is for. Every time you commit code, you're creating a release candidate. The purpose of the pipeline is to kill the release candidate. It's to prove it's not good enough. Okay, so you can't do that if you're not testing all the things. So back to our teams. We very well may have external teams that are running security. It might be the product teams too, but there might be in your organization because of requirements or, or compliance regulations or whatever, external teams that are also running tests. So security tests and stuff from OWASP, you know, et cetera. Um, you might be running compliance tests down there. Um, uh, you might be doing performance tests, or you might need to do performance tests, things like that. There's all these things that can be tested. Um, the modern continuous delivery systems can do these things in parallel. Okay, so we don't have to slow down the development team. People are like, oh, I don't want to run it through a performance test every time because it slows down the, the pipeline. It doesn't have to. If you do it like this diagram is, notice where the arrows go. Those arrows actually have meaning here. What we're doing is we're saying that as soon as the unit tests pass, grab that package and ship it off to those other pipelines that are going to do security and compliance tests. Functional tests are going to pick it up too. When functional tests finish, go ahead and deploy to staging. The purpose of the staging environment in this diagram is to test the deployment. So staging needs to look as much like production as possible. So if production is a cluster, staging is a cluster. If, you know, same versions of kernels, everything. Identical. Maybe not identical size, but from an architecture perspective. The purpose of this staging environment, not, it's not, I say this because not all staging environments is true. The purpose of this staging environment is to, to test the deployment. I still want to do that as often as possible. But if a security test fails, it's not going to production. Okay, so you can do these things in parallel. You don't have to slow down your velocity. Um, there's a blog, I forgot to do a link on it. It's on gocd.org. Um, that shows the process that we have on a couple of our tools where if there's things like security things that we're fixing, there are people that can go in and press a button that grabs the artifact from the first one and deploys it to production. Now the other stuff still keeps running, okay? But there are ways, and every tool can do this, okay? There are ways that you can say, no, as soon as I have a build, deploy it. Okay, but that shouldn't be the default in my opinion. Now, I want to be clear, um, this stuff's hard. You know, I talked about re-architecting things. I talked about changing your organizational structure, possibly. Um, I can tell you that organizations I've seen where they change the structure. So think of the unicorns of today, the Nordstrom and Expedia and Nike and all these companies now. Um, this was a massive change for them to do this. This wasn't just, hey, let's write our code differently and let's teach some people Kubernetes. Incredibly valuable skills, but you, if the company still working the same way, if certain people are still um, they get their bonus only if we reach five nines uptime, but they get their bonus only if we get more features out. I mean, it's, it's, it's conflict, right? We have to put people on shared teams. We have to measure them the same way. Okay, everybody on the GoCD team, marketing people, development team, sales people, everybody, they're measured on open source adoption. How many people are using the open source version? Period. So they have other goals, okay, but when it comes down to, that's what they're measured on. The, Teams need to have this. Okay, so summary. Um, it's funny because this talk was originally supposed to be at 9 a.m. yesterday. And so I was going to tell you that you have come to the right place to learn more. But now it's the last talk of the day, so heck with you. Uh, but it's not actually true. So ideas from open space conversations. Um, I started, I went to my first DevOps days in Mountain View in 2010, I think. Um, and fell in love with it because of the open space stuff. It's like. In this, it's cool because you can have people talk at you. But in a little while, you're going to be able to talk amongst yourselves. And I often say, and I'm sorry if I'm stealing anyone's thunder that's going to do the open space thing, uh, if you leave a DevOps days and you didn't get to talk about the topic or learn about the topic you wanted to, your fault. Okay. So if you know something you want to share it, submit it. If you don't know something and you want to learn it, submit it. Some ideas, uh, in case I made anybody too angry, should DevOps be a title? Do we really need trunk-based development? You want to build or buy your paths? Is it you or is it Google? And with that, I'll still thank you. <laughs>